Hello, everyone. So I'm Stephen Drew, and we're joined here by Martin Andrews. And so Martin and I have been chatting over the last few days, talking a little bit about how students get a job at the moment in the current market. So part ones and part twos. And just for anyone that hasn't met you or seen you online, Martin, would you like to maybe say one or two little bits uh, about who you are and what you do? Yep, sure. I'm a registered architect. Uh, I'm also a principal lecturer at the University of Portsmouth um, within the Portsmouth School of Architecture. And at the moment, I'm academic lead for uh, admissions and recruitment. So my focus is uh, very heavy towards students at undergraduate, postgraduate, and also uh, students who are sort of uh, post-16. Okay. Um, so I do a lot of workshops and events with with uh, school students and school pupils. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been at the University for a, of Portsmouth for a significantly long period of time now. So yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat today. Oh, amazing. And so, so basically, you worked in industry for a few years, and now you teach and, and you see the other side of the coin. So it's a little bit like me, I worked in industry as well. And now I, I work in recruitment. So it's definitely, it's interesting seeing almost a few sides of, of the coin. And so what got us talking and, how, and we, how we met was dissecting and going through what is the best way or what is the most appropriate way or how would you, in this current situation as a part one or a part two, go about getting a job? And everyone has a different opinion. And there's, um, I don't think there is a, a step-by-step guide per se, well, what I've seen over the years is certain techniques from stuff that I've done personally and stuff that I've seen students do, which gives a higher chance of getting a job. And that's what I'm really interested in kind of thrashing out. So yeah. in almost giving the advice that I never got at the time, the do's and don'ts and what works and what doesn't. But um, what's, what do you notice at the moment? Uh, that works for students who get a job and maybe what do you see are things that some people do that almost hinder the process or slow it down for them okay so interesting so i, I come at this with uh, a multitude of different angles and perspectives because um when i worked in practice yeah. uh, i had part ones and part twos sending me letters you know yeah, okay. and cvs letters of application expressions of interest uh, when I ran my own practice, I got it as a as a practitioner, as the person of, you know, I was in charge of who's going to be sat with me in this office. Yeah. I now look at it from the perspective of, well, maybe uh, academics want to come and work within the Portsmouth School of Architecture. So I see that. Okay. But I also see um, our students in their second year of studies at undergraduate hoping to go out into placement and preparing for job applications. Mm. And obviously I see my part ones and my part twos at the end of their undergrad and postgrad preparing as well. So I've been sort of exposed to this from, from a multitude of, of, of different angles. And I think there's a lot of anxiety out there always, yeah. especially if they're, they're part one or the BA2 level where They've never really done this before. For maybe the students have gone out and they've worked part-time jobs, uh, yeah. maybe in the retail sector or food sector or something like that. And that's a slightly different approach. So mm. the thing that you can, and, and you may back this up, there's a difference between a CV for someone applying to an architectural practice or within the design industry yeah. and, and someone that's applying for a job with an accountant or with a lawyer. Completely. So the biggest thing that we always tell our students is, look, you know, you're in the visual industries, you're in the creative industries, make sure that your CV responds to that. So the CV can't just be a word doc. No. Not graphically presented. It has to be eye catching. Now, you know, you can do that on a number of different levels. So you can have, you can have the word doc which is just the same type font through. Okay. Mm. You can have something that's a bit more polished, simple type font, mm. maybe a couple of images. We'll talk about 
personal photographs on CVs later. Okay, all right. I mean, that's, that's something that's really. I'd, I'd, I was. I'd, I was never on my CV and portfolio. I don't. I don't think no one. No one wants to see my it, my wealth it, beard. You know, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't do well. So it's it's, a, it's an interesting talking point because it always gets raised. Okay, and um, then you can go the full. And you, we get some CVs that are amazing pieces of origami. You know that are given to Beautiful. you, and they sort of unfold, and that's just this amazing thing. So you know, not you don't have to do that, and and that takes a lot of time to do. But actually, you need to think. The first one is think really, really carefully about your CV. Secondly, think very, very carefully about what is going into your portfolio because you need a digital portfolio. You you just do whether it's the thing that you print off and you put in a portfolio case, and you walk into an interview if you're lucky enough to get. A spot, or you walk in with your laptop and you're able to open it, or it's something you send a prospective employer that's the best work that you've done recently. Mm. Now you and I talked about file sizes, didn't we? Getting into we the did. detail of this, right? Okay. So, so Stephen, what should all CVs and portfolios be able to do when you click on them? Open easily. <laughs> Oh, and you should be able to read them. Yeah. They shouldn't have any problems. And yeah. then, and I, and I think you've hit the nail on the head here because it's actually, I think you've unpacked it really well. And it, the, the, the catch is that we're all different as designers. So there is no one way on a CV and portfolio, but you're right, compared to a traditional format, the, the employer almost needs to get a sense of your design and your taste. But then also you need to kind of, in my opinion, tick the practical boxes so you as a practice manager you would be using autocad and maybe you've got a planning submission and actually you want to see that someone can do that as well as then from that have a a little taste of their design but where i find it really interesting is that i loved it when we were chatting about and i agree it's brilliant having an origami portfolio and i as someone in my remember in in my studio one of their uh, one of the one of the girls who was amazing bringing in this handmade, hand-woven portfolio book. And I remember thinking, oh, man, that I could never do that. What was interesting, though, is that I actually got a job before her, and it was purely because of the way I was going about the job search. And at the time, I think that she could only do a few versions of that portfolio because she had to make a lot of them, where at the time I sent out um, a clean CV with a cover and letter and a portfolio of six to seven pages where I talked about what software I use and I showcased my work and I sent it out to a lot of architecture practices. So we could argue that her portfolio was presented better and was more beautiful in terms of it was actually almost like an object, a feature. If an architectural practice got it through the post, it's the kind of thing you would take home to your partner and enjoy, and it would would be a a feature of a copy book. But I actually got more coverage out, and I sent it out to more employers, and I had more exposure. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, we've, we've, thinking about that idea about how do you um, gather together a body of creative work yeah and send it to someone to to pique their interest so only this year we've decided that we can record sketchbooks in a slightly different way okay, okay. so sketchbooks are beautiful things but they're very difficult to replicate because you don't really want to copy them do you because there's something about the texture of sketchbooks that are lovely yeah. So we've been going through this for a couple of years now. Last year, we got some guys to photograph the pages of the portfolio. But again, that becomes quite a weighty document, especially if you're trying to send it to someone. So do you know what we did this year? We filmed it. We filmed the portfolio, uh, the, um, the sketchbook, someone turning over the pages really nicely. That compressed down to a really small file. And that student, if they wanted to, can now send it off to... Uh, designers and practitioners to look at look at their work and it is just mm. a really nice way to do it and because it's high quality film on a tripod and the camera is really good quality 
then actually the person that opens that small movie file is able mm. to get a real feeling about the quality of that student. And so I think there are ways to do this in a clever way that at least gets your foot in the door. And I think that's the important thing is to be uh, memorable for the right reasons. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's ways you, okay. So just sort of responding to you, you said there was that, that fantastic student that produced this wonderful woven, what I would probably do now is I would maybe put a small video together that shows this portfolio being gone through. And I would probably send that out as a package to employers. But if I was lucky enough to get a job, I would take that physical portfolio with me yes. and I would go through it. So I think, <laughs> I think there's that thing where you just have to think of it in a slightly different way. It was a real moment for me and my colleagues when we realized that as long as we had someone that was careful turning over the pages of this thing, it'll be all right. It'll work really well. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, just think in a slightly different way about how you present your own work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I've got a question for you. Go on. I love it. We're okay. flipping this around. You're interviewing oh. me now, are we? Brilliant. Sorry. I love <laughs> okay. it. Do it. Come so on. I, you can say whatever you want, Martin. It's fine. Okay. All right. I, I, I have a tendency to, um, to uh, start swearing spontaneously, so I'll try and stop that. Um, right. <laughs> so there's, there's always a debate. It doesn't matter which cohort I'm working with in okay. undergrad or postgrad. Okay. Um, if you look at a lot of CVs that come from America or the United yeah. States – there will always be, I think, I, I, this is what I've seen from the research that I've done, which might be limited, but it's definitely something that gets discussed a lot. You'll find that the person who puts the CV or the portfolio together will include a picture of themselves on the CV. Yeah, okay. Now, staff that I've spoken to or colleagues that I've spoken to are divided, okay? Some say absolutely not you should not put your picture on a CV. Yeah. I have other colleagues who have done similar research to me and found that everyone else in the sector is doing it. So why shouldn't you do it as a student applying to a job? And yeah. there are lots of arguments around this, but I mean, from, you're, at the, um, you're at the pointy end of this. Yeah. You deal with this on a daily basis. It's your job. What's your view? What do you think? It's okay. I think generally the work should always speak, speak for itself, first and foremost. There is something about the human psychology that if you see the person, it's a bit like us on, on video now, there's a level where you feel like you know the person a bit more. Now, where it comes a bit complicated is that you can also, people have unconscious biases, right? So the thing is, people can make assumptions based upon that image which might be completely not true or it could actually almost detract from you getting the job and and, and that's the danger and so I, I generally say not to do it I've never done it myself at the same time where I've seen it be successful if it's maybe a picture which isn't almost like a passport painted picture maybe it's you doing photography and it's not the focus. It really, really shouldn't be the focus. Personally, I don't think you need it. The only time I've seen it be more closer to a prerequisite is in a client-facing role, such as a receptionist or front of house, because then the person can assimilate what they would, uh, who they would be meeting at, at, at the desk, and then they can visualize you working there. Yeah. That's the only time that I've seen it become a little bit more relevant but really in terms of part one and part two the work should speak for itself and so the 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 the, the, the danger is with a photo you can get hung up on it yeah. so i would generally not put it in it's it's interesting so uh i went for the the job role that i'm currently doing at the moment so about a year ago uh i put my put my hat in the ring went for the academic lead for um, admissions and recruitment. And I was sat there thinking, I need to do a CV. Mm. So I chose to put a photograph of me into the CV. 
Now the CV wasn't like this. The photograph wasn't, you know, a a stylized image, anything like that. So there, you've got to think the role was admissions and recruitment. Okay, so that's that's working with primary schools, secondary schools, colleges of further education. That's so the photographs I included on each of the pages of the CV. The CV was about three pages long. Was me working with pupils and students of different ages. So I was mm. sensitive to the way I portrayed the pupils and the students in the, in the image. So, you know, their identities weren't revealed. Okay. Yeah. So it was pictures of them working at a table and normally the back of their head, but you could see that I was in a, I was comfortably in a position of working in a group with these people. Yeah. So the focus wasn't on my ugly mug. The focus was instead on the fact that I was saying, look, if you appoint me to do this role, look, I do this role and, and here's photographic evidence. Right. So I think you're absolutely right. I think if you do include them, and many, many people don't, you need to make sure that they're relevant. Okay. Now, the other thing that makes an architecture or interior architecture and design CV different is the fact that we always encourage, I encourage our students to put their own work into the CV, like mm. really high quality edited images of an interior that they've produced or the exterior of a building in an urban complex, you know, something like that. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Let the work speak for itself. But occasionally, if you're confident enough, I think the idea of putting something in that hints at who you are is acceptable in some instances. So. Yeah. And I, I think what's interesting, we talked about a little bit about what goes into it. Where I find it more interesting though, is that, in my position, I'm very reluctant to comment on a student's design work once it's gone into a CV. And where where I'm um, sometimes astonished, and where I've done it myself, is that is that once it's more about mistakes that people do than the, that that lack of communication, which then actually stops them from getting the job. So I'm amazed sometimes, for instance, in a CV, if you if someone's done um technical drawings they're not in there and if they've used a certain set of software they're not in there as well and sometimes i've seen examples where i can speak to someone on the phone and they've actually done an internship in an architecture practice and that's not got on the cv and what's been on the focus on the cv is the last academic project which which is a natural feeling because if i've just done one year and i've worked in 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 in, in in your studio and we, we, I worked really hard and I got a first, I'm going to feel naturally proud of that. And it should go on there and that should be demonstrated. Where I, um, where I get surprised though, is that the, all the stuff before the internship before doing that project and, and the, the summer job where they were client facing or, you know, yeah. speaking to people and the, all the other bits and bobs that they've learned, the physical model, and the or maybe the the Revit skills and participating in a BIM talk group gets missed out, and that's the stuff that I feel can yeah. can actually stop you from getting the job because it's yeah. not just about how excellent your design is; it's about how you will fit into an office. So when you had a practice, Martin, there's the, there's that level of you want a good designer. You also need to know that they're going to solve a problem in the studio and then that's the bit that i when i speak to people on the phone or i speak to them now i'm i'm always amazed that still happens yeah it's it's about enriching your cv isn't it mm. to say yes absolutely i've got the education that means that i can go on the route to qualify as an architect or i can do my degree and i can come out as an interior architecture and design candidate and i also do these things and i've done these things and i've worked with volunteer groups and i play football for manchester united juniors and i it's that stuff that i go oh that's really interesting yeah and, and in terms of conversation pieces you know the the argument is that you might have a, a very very good student top quality student who is very good on their own, is very, very good academically, but maybe you don't think that their personality would fit into the office. 
Mm. However, you might interview someone that is maybe doesn't have the same, who hasn't achieved the same grades, but that has gone out and worked um, in other practices, has uh, interacted with uh, international design competitions, have yeah. done volunteer, and you think, wow, you know, th- that's the stuff that you think. It, yes, it is about grades and achievement of marks and things. But as you said, if you're thinking in a, in a practice setting when, then it, when, when it's more than just a sole t- practitioner or a sole trader, there's actually other people there, small, medium, large size practices, you want to make sure that that person has a character and can fit into the office. Yes, I agree. Uh, and, and that's the thing. The grades show what you've done and what you've accomplished. In my opinion, though, the employer wants to know, can you do the job and can you get along together and can you solve that problem? So if you have, for instance, have your own practice, Martin, you've got a residential scheme. You need to know that, that you can talk to someone on the level. They're going to help you as a human being. They're not going to crash the BIM model. Yeah. And that's the immediate problem. And then you'd like to know that you can build them up based upon their design skills, but it's actually the core problem it, that's what you're looking to solve and that's what you're looking to hire and i i i just love your I, I think where you hit the nail on the head is that and what i've learned is that in an interview it, it doesn't matter if you've got a first or anything like that if you can't convey who you are as a person and you can't speak to someone and communicate who you are on a human level then the reality is you won't make that connection because yeah. one of the things that i notice is even as human beings is that what we do is we all uh, make the decisions based upon emotion backed by fact. You, so after an interview, a positive interview, if, for instance, I've met someone that's really good, even I do it, I naturally go, he was amazing or she was amazing. She came in with this energy and I just was blown away. The design work was good. And then at the end you go, oh, yeah, and she had good grades and I'm pretty sure she can do Revit. It was the personality that got yeah. you there. And that and that and that's the thing. And so for me, when it, when to kind of bring it back to what we talked about at the start, the CV and portfolio is the window to get their attention. And to me, it's all about the the steps. As in, the in my head, the whole objective, the mission of the CV and the sample portfolio is to get you that interview, and to get you on that one to one, like we're talking now, so yeah. that you can have a conversation. And that's what I think it is. It really is a conversation. Of course, you should rehearse a few questions in your head so that you feel you covered the points. Yeah. But it's not a script. And, yeah. and, and you have to freestyle based upon the conversation. And that should be the goal. And, and, so, and that's why, bring it back even again, you've got the CV and portfolio, but it's like how you go about there in the real world and calling up companies and sending CVs. The more you do... Then the more, and the more uh, practical stuff you do, the more applications you send, the more calls you make as a human level, the more chances we get of these real conversations. And that's what's going to yeah. get you the job. Absolutely. I, I, just, right. I, I do. There you go. That's a little yeah. eureka moment, wasn't then, it? Yeah. That's really, right. I'm going to talk about three things to remind me. Right. Okay. There's, there's three things. So I recently went for an internal position at at the university yeah uh, about a month ago and the ask was please can you submit a cv and an expression of interest okay okay yeah i can do that not a problem at all so the expression of it the cv is easy because i obviously tried to sort that out when i got the role that i'm in at the moment so i thought okay expression of interest normally expressions of interest are really short but I was responding to every point in the application. So it turned into this beast, this absolute beast, four and a half thousand words, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, they didn't cap it. Sometimes I've done these jobs and they've said, or these job applications, they've said one A4. So they didn't cap it. So I'm like, okay, I'm bending the rules a bit. I am responding. I've gone through, okay, however, <laughs> who's going to read this unless their interest is peaked? Do you know what I decided to do? I did a short video, less than two minutes long, about me and some of the things that I could offer at this new position if I were 
appointed. Mm. And I think that thing of being able to go, right, I've written this really developed thing, which if they're interested by my CV and the short film, they can go and have a look more in depth. But actually, mm. it's about capturing and saying, I'm, an, I'm a nice person, I'm not a robot, and I've got a bit of experience, and I wonder how many other people who applied for that position submitted a video. You've got to think, in this, this world that we in, in live in, it was an academic job, right? In this world that we live in, we've gone teaching virtual learning environments, okay? So this job that I was going for had bits of that in it, okay? Yeah. So by doing this short video about me and saying that I can use, you know, Zoom and cameras and things, I'm sort of saying I'm quite comfortable in front of a camera and I can, I can make these short videos. <laughs> so it's like, and that's, you could, you could say the similar thing about a CV or, or a portfolio or just to grab the attention. Okay. So that's, that's, that's first thing. Second thing, mm. coming back to uh, what we were talking about, enriching the portfolio or enriching the CV. Okay. My part one experience was really interesting because obviously I went out uh, post 91, 92 recession, it was 1997. It was still very difficult in the construction industry and in architecture practice to get a job. Yeah. So I applied, I went for the quantity over quality to start with. Okay. So I just, I wasn't desperate, but I knew I wanted to be in a particular area. So I mail shot everyone but changed my letter of application to be personal to that practice. Okay, so I did lots and lots and lots. It was still very, very difficult. However, I got some interviews, and there was one particular interview that I got, and I swear that I got the job because we started talking about sport and football. Mm. So yes, I had a very, very nice CV. It was the size of a bus. Back then, it was when you had the A1 portfolios that you walked around. Oh, no, with. not anymore, right? That's no, 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 all in the past. No, that's it. But yeah, do your back in when you're carrying those around. <laughs> so I, it, it was fine. And we were going through the pages, me and the owner of the business, and we were looking through it, and it was great. And then he said, he, I think he said, he said, ow, when he was turning one of the pages. And I said, are you all right? And he said, I tweaked my back playing football last night. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, yeah, do you play football? And then that was it. Yeah. The door was open. And uh, I'm sure it wasn't just because I had, I had a sporting pedigree, but I think it really, really helped because then the interview, the atmosphere changed. It became yes. so much more friendly. We were able to talk about many things outside of the portfolio, not just about football and sport. And, and um, yeah, it, that, was, that was a really good you know, opportunity for me to talk a bit more about myself. The second, so the part two interview was um, a particular character, very senior within a well-known local authority architectural practice. Mm -hmm. He invited me in. There was his uh, assistant, someone from HR, and myself. So I walked in, A3 portfolio this time, because we've moved on a few years. Right? A3, I go through the portfolio. I know my script. I know about the practice. I know a lot about this particular individual as well. And it was dreadful, Stephen. <laughs> I, oh, I remember no. I, oh, it, was no. a, it was a proper, you know, we're just going to disagree on everything. I'm sorry, we just are. Back then, maybe I was a bit more opinionated, but, but you know, it was like, oh, dear. So um, the HR person finished the interview after about an hour and said, thank you very much. We'll be in touch soon. The assistant says, I'll show you down to reception. I'll show you, just show you out the building. So we're walking down the fire escape stair, and I said, oh, I'm really, really sorry. That was, that was awful. I normally interview really well. That, that was probably the worst interview in my life. And she said... No, 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 you've got the job. And I said, what? And, and she said, he really liked you. He liked that you fought back. And I was like, okay. So, you know, I've, I've now gone into interviews since that part to experience thinking it's all right as long as you have uh, a good reason mm. to be able to put your point of view across. Yeah. Whereas, whereas prior to that, I always thought just sit down and show your portfolio and just say yes to everything. Yeah. But, I think but it that. wasn't. So, you know, uh, learning experience. I think you've hit the nail on the head. For me, I always say 
the interview is just as much for you as it is for them. And it's very hard to remember that because the thing is, when you're going to an interview, you have to think about whether you want to work there as well. And it can be so easy to get enamored by the fact that there's a possible job there that you're almost instantly, as you say, in this yes mode, when you can be respectful, like you said, and thankful for the interview and still challenge certain things. And when I say challenge, it's not about being uh, aggressive or standoffish, not on about that. What we're on about is a um, professional or a personal disagreement or, or yeah. opinion piece. You know, well, I personally am more interested in this version of sustainability for this and this and that. Or for instance, in, in Revit, I model things in a particular way. I understand why you've modeled it in this way because the time constraints, perhaps in the next project, what I would recommend is that you, you check these resources and then suddenly you're offering value, insight, yeah. and you're showing how employable you are. Whereas you're right, whereas a yes person isn't necessarily all the right thing. And it's true that Will, who was actually does a lot of the podcast with me on my team. When I, we, in, in McDonald Company for graduates, sometimes what we do is we have five to 10 people come in at the same time, which isn't the case in architecture. But he was the only person that disagreed with me and fought the point. And he was the one I remembered. And he was the one I brought back for interview. Yeah. And it was purely because he challenged me on something that when I said, I didn't necessarily agree with myself. But what it was, was a conversation piece. And, yeah. and, and it was on that basis, which I, I was like, this is someone that when I work with that will respectfully tell me if he disagrees, which, which is a power in itself. Definitely. And I think, again, you know, we're talking about um, photographs on CVs, profile photographs. It's, that, it's the same thing with this. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely fine to have your own opinion. And it's OK as long as uh, you're respectful. And it's about making the judgment. If you're really rude and you started swearing, you started throwing your portfolio across the room and, and being a bit arrogant, that's not right in any circumstance. That's not right. But to actually say, you know, what well, that's, that's a really interesting point. Thank you very much. However, mm. I chose to do it this way because, and I mean, there's, so uh, a few years ago, he's now got his own architectural practice in Winchester. He's, he's a great guy. He was a mature student coming through Portsmouth Uni when I taught him in architecture. Um, and I just remember being blown away because I was probably in my, I think I was in my early 30s. So I was quite new to part-time teaching, but I also ran my own practice. And he uh, disagreed with the things that I was saying. And I remember <laughs> thinking, wow, this, this is amazing because, okay. And I took it on as a challenge. The funny thing is, I later employed him as an assistant within the practice, and it was brilliant because he was such an asset. He was deeply reflective as well as questioning in the right way. And, I, and he was funny. He was so funny that actually that combination made me think, do you know what? Outside the academic sphere, I think I could quite happily work with you. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he's now, he's now got a brilliant practice, very contemporary architectural practice in Winchester. Um, so it's good. It, it, you know, I, I couldn't, I've, I've obviously taught hundreds and hundreds of students over the years. Um, I've probably got a, a, a nice story about the majority of them, but not all of them. Oh, well, and that's life. Yeah. And it's the, it, it's the, the, it's the snippets, those stories that stay with you. And it's that thing about being memorable. I think that's really, really important. Um, well, what I liked, uh, and while you were talking about the photo, and what I liked about it, when you were talking about the video as well, and it kind of links back to the phone, because for me in the interview, it's the magic of talking. It's like even this, we're, 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 at, we're on the chat now, and who knows where it goes. And along the way, you, you make certain discoveries, and things happen. But the thing is, with a photo, it's static, right? I don't think it offers anything. Whereas what you were talking about with video before, it there's a, so much more personality that comes across from it. Tone, emotion, excitement, and joy, and all that stuff comes across. Whereas in a picture, it can be interpreted one way. And so to me, a picture is more like a text. And so it's the whole thing of sometimes when you get a text and you're like, is he being sarcastic? Or, and it can be so misinterpreted. And I yes. think that is the danger with a photo. Yeah. So it can work, it can, and sometimes it cannot. 
And I think with a video, and it's and and that's why even in my role, that's why speaking on the phone helps so much more because people get a sense of excitement or engagement. Yeah. And 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 it goes back to when we talked about before when you send a CV, if you actually phone as well. Suddenly, what you visualize is the the employer starts visualizing you as a person and yeah. not necessarily just a CV commodity. You know, it's not just the CV. The CV comes with the person, and the person who rang up is someone that can have a conversation and is someone that then becomes more tangibly real. That you then get an interview. Yeah. You know, because you you you're slowly going. You're becoming more and more realistic. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. So I've I've had lots and lots of students over the years who have said I've sent out so many CVs, letters of application, portfolios, but I've just not had a response. Uh, oh, that's, that's that's a real shame. Uh, can you tell me your process? Yep, I emailed them, and then that's <laughs> it. And I'm like, okay, but have you have you phoned them? No. Okay, so what I'm finding on reflection over the years that not everyone who applies for jobs phones to follow up or like you said, uh, you know, we had a conversation earlier, actually goes down to the practice if they're local, knocks on the door and says, hello, I'm Brian. And I wondered if you got my CV yet. Mm. And it makes such a difference because, you know, if you can find, I mean, obviously there's there's, uh, some practices out there who might have a central HR department that might not reveal their telephone number. But if you do a bit of research, you could probably find out how to contact them. So yeah. I think that the, the big takeaway that I have to my students is that, or that I say to my students is, you know, just follow up. Mm. You've got nothing to lose. You don't have to have a big patter, a big spiel rehearsed because the likelihood is you'll get through to someone uh, in the office, who picks up the phone and says, how can I help? And your question is, I, I, I recently applied for a job application within your practice. My name is X, and I wonder if you could give me an update. That's mm. it. That's enough to just open the door for a for a conversation. You might get put on to a director. You might get put on to a project architect. You might just talk to the practice administrator. It doesn't really matter. You're mm. getting yourself known. And I think that's where a lot of the, the students that I've worked with miss a trick. It, it, it's, it, it's all of this, actually. If you, if you reflect on what we're talking about, it all comes back to being memorable for the right reasons. Mm. Um, and I think going out there and getting... And, and, and the other thing is, it's about if there's no job ad, you should still send an application. You can't wait for a job application or you can't wait for the employer to come back you have to in a nice way and it goes back to that thing of what we're talking in an interview it's like the challenging thing in a nice way what you're doing is you're politely re-engaging with the company and they might go do you know what we were just going to put an ad on let me get your application out i'll give it to the director jeff now and yeah. suddenly through you ringing you've created yourself an opportunity and you've done it because you've the reason you've got that is because you've done something which people typically don't do. And in life, I think yeah. that kind of attitude and that go-getter is who people want in their companies and uh, because it's, it's taken initiative. And I think that if you're waiting for a part one role to be posted on Dezine, then when you send that application off, it will be with 300 people. Um, but if you go out and you find every architecture practice close to you and slowly build it out and send... CVs, you're creating opportunities which were off the guard, off the beaten track, and therefore are more likely to be hidden gems, or you're more likely to yeah. get the attention. I, 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 again, I completely agree. My, I've, I've talked about the interview for my part two, which was interesting and challenging at the same time. But I, I finished my. It was back then. It was the diploma in architecture. Now it's obviously the M Arch. I finished my diploma and I knew that I wanted to work for that practice, but I didn't want to go out into the industry at the same time as all the other architecture graduates. I, I just thought that was, was madness. And I thought in my mind, well, why don't I delay it a bit? I think February would be quite good because I think there's probably going to be an upswing. So this was a few years later. So this was in the early noughties. I think there's going to be an upswing and they'll be taking people on. What can I do? 
So they were uh, playing around with the idea of a, a master's course, an, an M Arch, a Master of Architecture at Portsmouth. And, and I was told that it was a year long and that would I like to be the first person to do the M Arch? And it was, um, it was, I could have done a design project. I could have done, done a written piece. I chose to do a written piece in the end. And I thought, this is really good because if I finish in the February, if I finish early, then I'm bang, I'm there. I'm, I'm in practice. And all the, uh, all the staff said to me, you'll never do it. You'll never do it, in a, you'll never do it in six months. It'll be a year. Anyway, I did it in six months. Yeah, well done. Finish, thank you. Finish the Masters. <laughs> and I was able to go out at a time when most architectural practices may have been looking for part twos, but probably thought there was a bit of a drought because most part twos would have been finishing their postgraduate studies. Mm. And I think that's partly why, because the, the practice that I went to is very well known. And that summer, when they had released their part one and part two jobs, there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were applying for it, because it's such a popular practice. Mm. So when I applied in the February, or probably the January, the February, it wasn't as popular. And the numbers had come right down. So I gained a, another postgraduate qualification, which is advantageous to me. I'd done a bit of uh, really solid research that's backed up my professional ambitions and my professional understanding of certain things. But it also got me into to being able to be shortlisted for a job that I wanted to do. So sometimes thinking a little bit differently about how you apply mm. is a good thing. Um, and I think especially now with the COVID-19 situation, you may find, I don't know, any statistics or data or anything at all that, that backs this up, but I, I wonder if you find a lot of part one graduates um, decide that they'll just go straight through and do their postgraduate studies instead of taking a year out in practice. Because, think, yeah. you know, it's another two years. It'll help the economy. Um, the economy will recover, hopefully, in that period of time. And then maybe by the time they finish their postgrad, they're able to go out and apply. So I don't know. It's just a thing off the top of my head. No, you I might think, find that. So. I think it, it, it will. And if that happens, I think it will be accepted. But what I'd like to reiterate is I think the wrong thing to do would not to be to apply to places or not try it and then just think, you're not going to get anything and jump oh. straight back into industry because oh, no, no, no. you have to apply. You have to. You have to give yourself the benefit because when I when I did it, I sent. It was 2009. It was recession. Everyone was scared. There was no jobs, yeah. and it was a little bit like I was reading your notes earlier. You had seven interviews from a hundred applications, and yeah. I think I think in 2009 I had eleven interview requests from. I looked and it was something like 800. Wow! But at the time, at the time, it was what it took. And it, but it, honestly, Martin, that's all I did for two days is I sat down in front of a computer for two days in the studio, and I went through the through the the websites, chuck chuck chuck, look for a director's name, read a bit about it, and then I didn't overly pretend I know I was more direct, so it was personalized. Said who I am and an availability. And the other thing that I did is that I did it a week or two before some of the students because some people were like, I'm going to have a break because I'm stressed. You know, it's been really stressful in the end of your show. And I applied during the end of your show. So I did the plinth and then I was sending out the applications. And I think it goes back to what you're saying about timing. Yeah, maybe nice. I was at the top of the queue. And that's the thing. And maybe someone behind me might have a, a better CV right because it can be competitive the thing is though I was at the top of the queue then I got in for the interview and then when you're there it's like I was trying to know it was like seizing the moment and yeah. winning someone over because when you're yeah. in the room and if you can create that palpable excitement and you and you both get along then you're going to get the job yeah and they're not going to look at the next CV because they're like I like Martin he is the guy for the team just get Martin in and that's done. And then, and, and so I think early bird does catch the worm, you know, yeah. some, I, I yeah. really do. No, definitely. I, I am very, very conscious that my wife, who's a lawyer is about to go onto a conference call in the same room as me. Don't worry. I think that's so, the perfect note to, uh, to end so, it on as well. So I wondered if that, this is a good, good, time to finish because we've been we've been uh, talking now for a, a little bit of time haven't we and I think we've covered lots of things I mean what I would love to do what I would love to do is is maybe flip the table and we could do one of these in the future about what 
your experiences were for part one. Okay. Because I would love to find out what it right. was. Deal. So, yeah. well, we'll do that. But we need to make sure that you're around to do that. And I don't <laughs> want to get in, in trouble with Mrs. Andrews. No. So thank you, Marlin. For anyone that's here, though, where do they, if they want to get in contact with you, where oh. should they find you? Find me on LinkedIn, Martin yeah. Andrews, and all of my contact details are there. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. This has been awesome. I will now stop the recording. Thank Thanks you so much. Let's, Cheers, Stephen. We'll, we'll end it there. Thank you. Yeah.